I hope this works. Thanks very much. I'm very proud to be here, but I'm proud because of one and very specific reason. I was just told that this hall was once a church, and now it's a kind of a cultural home for talks, concerts. My God, this is what they were doing to churches in the late 20s and early 30s under Stalin. No, like, you know. <laughs> turning them into homes of culture where they had at concerts and so on. So it's nice to be here in the <laughs> truly Bolshevik part of London. Okay, uh, let me begin with uh, ideology today. The book that I'm supposed to present or rather somehow refer to, Living in the End Times, is basically an attempt to practice again the old half-forgotten art of critique of ideology. First, through a couple of examples, I will simply try to convince you that ideology is well kicking alive and so on. Let me start with an example which may even surprise you. The two big Oscar winners of the last year. One, British one, The King's Speech, and the other one, The Black Swan. I cannot imagine almost a better example of ideology. Let me begin with the king's speech. The problem of the to-be king, the cause of his stuttering, if you saw the movie, is what? It's his inability to assume his symbolic function, to identify with his title. So I claim, on the contrary, at the beginning of the film, the future king is quite a normal, reasonable person. He simply displays a minimum of common sense, like who can be stupid enough to say, oh my God, it's my divine right to be the king, and so on and so on. And I read a movie as a very sad tale of how to make this guy, who obviously has some intelligence, stupid enough to accept seriously that he is the king. You remember how it happens. Towards the end of the film, uh, the trainer, the Australian trainer, sits on the king's chair. The furious king asks him, how dares he to do this? And the coach replies, why not? What right do you have to sit on this chair and not me? The king shouts back, because I am a king by divine right, to which the coach just nods with satisfaction. I've rendered him stupid enough, now he takes himself <laughs> seriously, and so on. It's, uh, I think, seriously, that the message is very sad here. It's, you know, we are all the time, from all sides, we are informed how we live in a crisis of authority, male patriarchal authority, of course, the reactionary perception, or rather conservative, of the crisis. And the lesson of the movie is precisely, although you men know that, to take your symbolic title, father, master, teacher, king, seriously. It's a little bit stupid, but it's your duty to accept this stupidity, to become stupid enough to play the role of authority. Now, uh, the uh, other film, The Black Swan, I claim, I hope you noticed it, with Natalie Portman and so on, is even much worse. It's truly a kind of anti-feminist counterpart. Uh, it, I claim, resuscitates arguably one of the most reactionary myths about femininity. While in this same masculine universe that we encounter in the king's speech, while a man, if you become stupid enough, at least can have it both. You can have your title, authority, and still have a private life, let, let's call it. It's an old anti-feminist myth from old fairy tales up to Kislovsky, Krzysztof Kislovsky's film Double Life of Veronique, namely this myth that a woman has to make a choice. Your natural place is to withdraw from, from public career, to do your role in the family, if you choose your, let's call it, mission, what you really care about as a career, you will pay the price for it by death. I think these are the coordinates of the second film. So, you see, that's where we are 
in two of popular films. Men become stupid enough, play your authority. Women don't play with career, you will die. <laughs> now, uh, let me, now, uh, uh, how? Now, let's make a step further through some other examples from movies. Uh, how can we detect this ideological background in popular culture? I think that the basic rule here is to apply the concept which was elaborated by structural linguistics of so-called differentiality. It doesn't only matter what a thing is, it only also matters as its positive feature what a thing is not. It doesn't only matter what you say, it only also matters what you don't say while saying what you say, of what is only implied in saying what you say. <laughs> of course, I hope you know that there is a dialogue, one of the best-known dialogues in Sherlock Holmes' stories. Uh, this one is from Silver Blaze, a dialogue, short dialogue between Detective Gregory and Holmes himself, which provides the best example of differentiality. It's a short dialogue exchange about so-called curious incident of the dog in the ninth time. Here is the dialogue. Is there any other point to which you wish to draw my attention? Asks Detective Gregory Sherlock Holmes. To the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog did nothing in the night time. That was the curious incident. Uh, how does this work in ideology? Uh, there is a wonderful joke in Ernst Lubitsch's masterpiece, Ninochka. The hero visits a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. And here is the wonderful reply of the waiter. Sorry, we have run out of cream. We only have milk. Can I then bring you coffee without milk? <laughs> I think it's absolutely a correct answer. It's not the same thing coffee without cream or coffee without milk. What you don't get, it's part of the identity of what you do get. In what sense? Because uh, if you bring this logic to its extreme, you can also see how a double negation, when you don't have just, when you do not have, in this case, coffee without cream or milk, the result is not zero, but what? Another my last example from popular culture, uh, from, I think it's from early 90s, you remember the movie with Ivan McGregor before he became a Jedi, when he was still playing uh, 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 working class uh, guys, brushed off. The hero accompanies to her home after their date, a young pretty woman who at the entrance to her flat tells him, would you like to come in for a coffee? He answers, there is a problem, I don't drink, drink, drink coffee. She retorts with a smile, no problem, I don't have any. <laughs> what I like is that, you know, what you get through this double negation is probably the most, not vulgar, but open erotic invitation. Like, that's my point. I invite you for a coffee, then I negate coffee and the result is not zero. The result is pure uh, invitation. Why lose time with such dialectical jokes? Because I claim they allow us to grasp how ideology functions. To detect so-called ideological distortions, you should note not only what is said, but the complex interplay between what is said and what is not said. Which unsaid is implied in what is said? Do we get coffee without cream or coffee without milk? There is even a direct political equivalent to this joke about coffee without cream, without milk. A friend, an old dissident from Poland, told me. Uh, uh, in a well-known well joke from socialist Poland, a customer enters a store and asks, you probably don't have butter, or do you? The answer, sorry, but we are not the store which doesn't have butter. We are the store which doesn't have toilet paper. The one that doesn't have batteries across the street, and so on. Okay, but now let's take another, a little bit more elaborate example. 
In today's Brazil, they have carnivals, and as they like to put it, people from all classes dance together on the street, momentarily obliterating their race, class, and so on differences. But it is obviously not the same if a jobless worker delivers himself to free dance, forgetting his worries about how to feed his family, or if a rich banker lets himself go and feels good about being one united with the people. They are both dancing on the same street, but the worker is dancing, as it were, without milk, while the banker is dancing without cream. You can also imagine a brusk off dialogue between United States and Europe in late 2002, when the invasion of Iraq was being prepared. The US saying to Europe, would you care to join us in the attack on Iraq to find the weapons of mass destruction? Europe critical replied, but we have no facilities to search for the weapons of mass destruction. Then Rumsfeld or some American guy answers, no problem, there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I mean, it was exactly the same logic. Now, uh, now, I, now let's put things in a little bit more serious way. Why do we not see what, nonetheless, in a way, we see in ideology? How does ideology enact this suspension? Uh, I claim, I'm sorry if you know it already, but it's crucial, that there is a, a wonderful, apocryphal probably, anecdote from the First World War which perfectly renders our predicament today and how we see things that we see but we don't see things that we also see. It's uh, the anecdote about the exchange of telegrams between German and Austrian army headquarters in the middle of the First World War. The Germans from Berlin sent the message to Vienna. Here on our part of the front, the situation is serious but not catastrophic. To which, of course, as you know, the Austrians replied, here the, with us, the situation is catastrophic but not serious. Is this not more and more the way many of us, at least in the developed world, relate to our global predicament. We all know about the impending catastrophe, ecological, social, and so on. But we somehow cannot take it seriously. In psychoanalysis, this attitude is called a fetishist split. I know very well, but, but what? But I do not really believe it. And I think, such a split is a clear indication of the material force of ideology which makes us refuse what we see and know. We can also call this the mechanism of what Freud sometimes refers to as uh, isolierung, isolation, where you accept a fact, but don't take it, don't, you do not what you abstractly know, you do not really, how should I put it, at a symbolic or affective level, you do not really integrate it. You just rationally deal with it as if this is the case, but again, you somehow suspend its, let's call it, symbolic efficiency. This, again, I claim, is how ideology more and more functions today. Ideology is not in, in what you know or you don't know. You can know quite a lot of things. Ideology is, resides in this underlying selection where some things, although you know them, you behave, act as if you don't know them. Uh, let me uh, improvise a little bit here because I think this ideological mechanism is crucial. Uh, this is what I call the fetishist functioning of ideology. The old traditional functioning of ideology was more symptomatic, you know, symptom, like return of the repressed. You base your life on a lie, you repress, ignore some traumatic truth, but as we say it, whatever you do, the repressed will somehow return in one or another symptomatic form. Just to give you a stupid everyday example, the proverbial adolescent who is traumatized by sex and in order to 
in order to forget about it, takes refuge in physics and mathematics. But then you know, sooner or later, he tries to resolve a, a task like how much energy is released when two bodies hit, it, hit each other and so on, and it's there. But a much more interesting, I claim, is the fetishist functioning, which again is operative today, where you don't deny anything. You just, through a fetish, enact a distance of not really accepting it, not really taking it seriously. Incidentally, as I developed also in this last book, Living in the End Times, this, I think, explains why and how, although we, most of us at least, probably not only believe scientists and in this sense know very well that the situation is potentially uh, catastrophic, but like really are convinced that this is the case, but nonetheless are not ready to do anything. Again, although we know there are threats of catastrophes, we cannot bring ourselves to, to act upon it, to do it. Here, fetish enters. What is fetish? I will repeat an old story of mine, which is very tragic. It happened to a friend of mine who was married, and his wife died, young, beautiful wife, the usual story. You know, she went to a doctor, uh, breast cancer in two months, she was dead. What surprised us, his friends, is that this same lady, sorry, this same guy, after the wife died, was absolutely ready all the time to talk about the most painful moments of the wife dying. You know, we didn't have to play any of these games, oh, don't mention this in front of him, it will traumatize him. No, he was ready to talk about everything. So we doubted, my God, we started to raise questions. What's going on with this guy? Like, is, did he love his wife at all? Is he a kind of a cruel, cynical subject or what? Then we learned the secret. Every time that he was talking about his dead wife and the most painful moments of her death, he was playing with a hamster in his hands, and the hamster was obviously his fetish. This was also uh, the preferred pet animal of his wife, so in a way, Playing with the hamster meant I can talk about it, but hamster was the fetishist stand-in for my wife is still alive. I don't accept she is dead. Now you will say, bullshit, this is primitive pseudo-analysis. How do I know it? Unfortunately, I do know it, because this hamster died half a year later, and immediately the guy collapsed, start for a week, every second day, made a suicide attempt and had to be immediately hospitalized. So again, I claim that from here you can see how interesting is socially, ideologically, the functioning of a fetish. Fetishists are not idiots, like you have your fetish feet and see nothing else. No. Fetishists can be very brutal, cynical, realistic. They pretend that they accept the life the way it is. Why? Because secretly their fetish enables them to acquire a distance, not to, as we put it in traditional terms, fully emotionally assume what they rationally know. Uh, for example, my thesis is that if you look at modern top managers, especially in the United States, one of the model fetishes is uh, what I ironically call Western Buddhism, this kind of a vague spirituality, transcendental meditation, whatsoever. That's their fetish. They can play all the dirty market games, but deep in themselves they think, oh, I know this is just the game of appearances, the truth is in my inner self, and so on and so on. So again, you know, I claim that you cannot really be a fully cynical subject. People who pretend to be brutally cynical, I don't have any ideals, I know life is just a brutal struggle and so on, I claim there always is a fetish. The question to ask them is, okay, 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 but where is your hamster? Or whatever form this, uh, this, uh, hamster, this hamster has. And this hamster can also be, I don't have time to go into this direction, but nonetheless externalized, like in the sense of you should strictly distinguish between your subjective beliefs in the sense of what you take seriously, 
what you believe, and I, I will on purpose use this very clumsy formulation, and what you objectively believe without knowing that you believe it. I claim that the basic lesson of psychoanalysis today, still actual, fully actual today, is that it's exactly the opposite one of the one usually attributed to psychoanalysis, that we just pretend to believe beneath we are hedonists with all the dirty, obscene desires and so on. No, on the contrary, we believe much more than we know that we believe. Like, you, you can think, I'm a totally cynical person, I don't care, but in your acts, there is a belief embodied. This category, again, is absolutely crucial to them. Today, I claim. I'm sorry now if I repeat a short joke which I repeated at least 20 times, but it's just the pure structure of this paradox. You know, Niels Bohr, quantum physics, once was visited at a country, in his, at his country house by a friend. There he had above the entrance door a horseshoe. In Central Europe, the superstitious item signaling uh, 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 de uh, destined, that's the idea, to prevent evil spirits to enter the house. And the friend asks him, why do you have this here? Are you stupid? Are you superstitious? And Niels Bohr gave him a perfect answer. No, I'm not stupid. I'm a scientist. Of course, I don't believe in it. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> that's ideology today. We don't believe in it. We are all cynics. But... Actually, we believe in it much more.